We've made it to chapter 18 as I was studying this week and going back through some of the previous sermons, I realized that today is sermon number 40 in the book of Acts. So at this point, we've made it, uh, we've got, there's 28 chapters in the book of Acts, so we've got 10 more chapters, and at the rate we're going, we've probably got about 20 more weeks in the book of Acts. Are you ready? All right. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am, because I'm learning so much from God's Word. So in today's scripture, uh, we're going to we're going to look at where we left off last week, where Paul was in Corinth. If you remember, the Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul, was in the city of Corinth, and some pivotal things had happened while he was there. Verse two tells us that he met some new partners in the ministry and friends named Aquila and her uh, and his wife Priscilla. And verse four tells us that Paul began in Corinth as usual, by preaching in the Jewish synagogue. We, we see every place that Paul's been. The first thing he does, he goes into the Jewish synagogue and he reasons with the people. Verse 5 said that Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Unfortunately, though, many of them rejected the gospel. And in verse 6, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, Paul shook out his garments And he said he was done. He said that he was no longer responsible for them. He said, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. For now I will go only to the Gentiles. But the praise the Lord that in verse 8, many of the Corinthians who heard the word of God and the good news about Jesus believed and were baptized. Then in verse 9 and 10, Paul received amazing encouragement from the Lord when he said, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And then we see in verse 11 that Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and six months teaching the word of God among the people there. Now, that was a long stint for Paul. We don't get the indication that he was in any other place for a long time. But Paul was able to stay in Corinth for quite some time ministering to the gospel. And things were going well. Things were going good. He was seeing people come to know the Lord. But then what we're going to see in today's passage of Scripture is once again, the people turned. And the people became more interested in their own agendas, more interested in the things that they were doing and less interested in what God had for them. So in today's scripture, we're going to see that some trouble arose for Paul. Uh, And so if you have your Bibles opened, and I hope you do, to the book of uh, Acts chapter 18, I'm going to begin reading in verse 12. And this morning we'll read through verse 17. The words will be on the screen if you don't have a copy of God's word with you. Beginning in verse 12. But when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names, your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. Does that sound like a familiar story? When I read that, all I could think about was Pontius Pilate washing his hands and not being willing to crucify Jesus. In verse 16, he said, And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sothenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of this. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for today, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. God, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had this morning to see people come and and acknowledge that they have been raised from death to life, God, and make that public in baptism, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would also be with these families who have dedicated their children today, God. Lord, it's not going to be an easy path, but you promise, you never promise that it's going to be easy. You just say that you'll be with us. And you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so, God, we trust in you. And we rely on you for that. Lord, it's in your gracious and loving heavenly name we pray today. 
Amen. So today's sermon is titled, What Kind of People Does God Want Us to Be? So with that, I say, what kind of person are you? I've always been told my entire life that it takes all kinds of people to make the world go around, right? It takes all different kinds. And I would say that that's true, but unfortunately, today a lot of people are as mixed up and messed up and crazy as can be. And some days I wonder if the world wouldn't be better off without some of them. If the world wouldn't be better off with, without having all of those different kinds of people to make the world go around. As I was preparing, I read a story about a 23-year-old man from Portland, Oregon. His name was Matt Wilkinson, and Matt was a snake collector. I don't know about you, but I don't do snakes. I don't think there's any kind of good snake. All these people are like, don't kill the rat snakes because they take care of everything else. The only good snake, in my opinion, is a dead snake. If you don't agree with me, we can talk about that after church. Matt was a snake collector. One day, he caught a 20-inch rattlesnake on the highway three weeks later Matt wanting to impress his ex-girlfriend with hopefully the intent of getting back together with her he decided to put the snake's head in his mouth ladies is there anybody here that that would impress I hope not and I hope that it didn't impress her either this happened at a barbecue and he was bitten and yes he almost died and later after he recovered, he said, that snake really got a hold of my tongue. You're supposed to laugh. Sorry. It wasn't near as funny when I read it to you as it was when I read it. I just think people like that need some help, maybe. And it takes all kind of people to make the world go around. There are some kinds of people in the world that... We don't want to be like, and I would say that Matt Wilkinson is one person that I don't want to be like. I don't want to think that I have to put a snake in my mouth to impress someone. But this morning, what kind of people does God want us to be? If we know that that's not what we want to be, and we don't feel like that's what God would want us to do, because nowhere in the scripture do I find God telling me to do something with a the snake, then what kind of people does he want us to be? And this morning, in the time that we have left, I want to share four things that I believe comes from this passage of Scripture that help us to understand the kind of person that God wants us to be. First, I believe that God wants us to be people who have problems for the right reasons. God wants us to be people who have problems for the right reasons. Now you look at me and say, Pastor Chris, God wants me to have problems? Well, I often say, and I've said a couple of times today, that God never promises that the road will be easy. He only promises to never leave us nor forsake us, to leave us on the road high and dry. And so everyone has problems. We all have them. We all encounter them. Some people have problems that they do dumb things to impress their girlfriends is the reason they have problems. But Paul here, we see, was having a problem in these verses because he was doing his absolute best to serve the Lord. He was doing everything within his power to spread the good news about Jesus Christ. He was doing everything that he could think of to share the gospel with people so that they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus and would not go and die and spend eternity in hell because Paul understood the ramifications of death without a relationship with Jesus. And so Paul was doing everything he could to win as many for Christ as he could. And we see all throughout the book of Acts the trials and the tribulations that he goes through. And he has problems, but friends, I believe Paul had problems for the right reasons. Remember in verse 5, it says that Paul was occupied with the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And in verse 8 Many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And then verse 11, it says that Paul stayed for a year and six months and, te and taught the word of God to the people in Corinth among them. But then in verse 12, out of nowhere, out of the blue, bam, tribulation hit again. Trials hit again when it says, but when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, Achaia the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Friends, Paul encountered struggles once again. 
everybody has problems and sometimes they jump on us without any warning. Sometimes life is going along like it was for Paul for a year and a half. He didn't have any persecution. He was preaching and teaching the word of God. And then bam, just like that, tribulation hits again and troubles hit. Friends, I don't know what it is for you. Maybe you went to the doctor this week and got a diagnosis that you weren't prepared for. Maybe you went to work this week and were told something by your boss that wasn't very pleasant. Maybe your children sprung something on you this week and you didn't know how to respond. Friends, I want you to know that we all have struggles. We all have problems. But let's make sure that since we're going to have problems, we're having them for the right reasons. If we have to be tired, let's be tired for the Lord. There was a group that when John and I were in college, I don't know if John, I know John remembers this because we talk about it often. There was a Southern Gospel group that came and sang at the church that we were serving at. And I don't remember the name of the group, but I'll never forget they had a song, and I promise you the title of it was, It's a Good Tired. And we thought to ourselves, there's no such thing as a good tired. But friends, if I'm tired because I'm so involved in working for the gospel, that's a good kind of tired. If we're going to be tired, let's do it for the Lord. If we're going to have to do without, let's do without for the Lord. If we have to get passed over for promotion, let's get passed over because we refuse to do something shady or against the rules. If someone chooses to reject us, may it be because they are rejecting the Lord and what we're doing for the Lord. Everybody has problems. Let's just make sure that we have problems for the right reason. An ultimate example of this was in the sacrifice of a young man named Daniel Robah. Most people have never heard of Daniel. He was a modern-day hero, though. Daniel was a student at Columbine High School on that horrible day when two other students went on a rampage of vicious violence and terror. That day, Daniel was in that school, and, and it was April 20th, 1999. And 12 students and one teacher were killed that day. And Daniel was one of those. You see, Daniel was running around and there was lots of things. There was some bombs that were set to go off in the lunchroom and that didn't happen. And people started getting out of the school and Daniel was one of the first ones to get out. And rather than continue to run, Daniel stood and he held the door so that the people could just freely run out the door. Daniel sacrificed that day for his classmates and his friends. He stood at the door and he was killed that day while he was holding the door. Daniel had problems for the right reasons. He was helping his classmates. He was known for sharing the gospel. He was one that was showing the love of Jesus. You see, that picture is a picture of sacrifice similar to the one that Jesus made for you and I. Similar to the one that he showed for us on the cross. Jesus died for us so that we could live forever. In that moment, Daniel didn't die for those students so they could live forever because he doesn't hold that key, but he died for that moment so that more students could get out of the building. And he paid an ultimate sacrifice that day. And it's almost certain that we will never be called on to make a sacrifice like that, and I pray to God that no one in this room is. But in little ways, in every way, let's give ourselves for the cause of Christ. This way, we will have problems for the right reasons. So I believe that God wants us to have problems for the right reasons. But what else? What other kind of person does God want me to be? I believe God wants us to be a people who remember that he is in control. Who was in control in verse 12 when the, the guys from the pro-council came and, and brought Paul before the tribunal? Was it Galileo or was it God? It must have helped Paul a lot to know that God was the one in control. Galileo could have done anything he, he wanted to. And I'm sure that the proconsul thought that he was in charge. I'm sure that the Roman Empire thought that he was in charge. But friends, instead, that day, God was in, got in charge. And as Paul stood before his accusers and the Roman proconsul, it must have helped him to know that God was in control. You see, this is a truth that we live by and that we can trust in. To know that God is always in control. 
God's word makes this clear throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see lots of stories in, in different rulers. We see how God is in control with the winds and the waves. We see how God is in control through the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. Friends, we see all throughout the Bible that God is in control. Pastor James Brown once said that there is no situation that God can get him out of. There's no situation that God couldn't get him out of. Then James gave this testimony when he shared that. He said, some years ago he was learning to fly. His instructor told him to put the plane into a steep and extended dive and he was totally unprepared for what was about to happen. After a brief time of that steep and steady dive, the engine on the plane stalled. That's why I don't get on airplanes. He said he was totally unprepared. And the plane began to plunge out of control. It soon became evident that the instructor was not going to help him. And after a few seconds of what seemed like an eternity, Pastor James said that his mind began to function again. He quickly corrected the situation. Immediately, he turned to the instructor and began to yell at him and vent his frustrations of, Why did you put me in a situation like this? Why would you do this? And the instructor looked at him very calmly and he said, Son... There's no position that you can get this airplane into that I cannot get you out of. If you want to learn to fly, go up there and do it again. At that moment, Pastor Brown understood that what that meant about there being no situation that God couldn't get us out of. He felt like God was saying to him right then, Remember this, as you serve me, there is no situation that you can get yourself into that I cannot get you out of. If you trust me, you will be all right. Now, friends, I want us to understand. God may not always get us out of situations the way that we think he should. God may not always answer the, the prayers the way that we think they should. <clears throat> and sometimes what we pray for is not at all how God answers the prayers. Garth Brooks had an old song back when I was in school. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Friends, sometimes we look back on life and we do thank God for unanswered prayers because we understand that His will is better than ours and that when we trust God and we trust that He's in control, life will go so much better. So if you've ever get halted before a court for the cause of Christ the way that Paul did, People who have problems for the right reasons and people who trust that God is in control are in a lot better place than those who don't. But thirdly this morning, I believe that this passage of Scripture helps us to understand that people who rely on God for his help are the kind of people that God wants us to be. He doesn't expect us to have all of the answers. He doesn't expect us to be able to fix everything by ourselves. That's why he wants us to trust in him. You see, God has all kind of ways that he helps his people. And sometimes he helps us even in surprising ways. Things look pretty bad for Paul in verse 13. He faced a serious charge. They said, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. According to what he was being accused of, he was doing like one of the ultimate sins of the Roman law. And that's what he was being accused of. And I'm guessing that Paul didn't expect to get any help from the Roman Galileo. He was just trusting that whatever happened would happen. But he was going to go on doing what God had called him to do, even if that meant he got beat to the point of death again. Because he knew that he had done what God had called him to. But then in verse 14 and six through 16, we see what happened. And Paul was very surprised. It says, the Roman Galileo said this, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O oh Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. Friends, God has all kinds of ways that he helps his people. Sometimes it's just like this. Sometimes he steps in and he delivers us from situations that we get ourselves into. Sometimes it's the end of life. We don't always see that as God helping us. But sometimes he calls his saints home. 
Oswald Chambers shared in his devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest, Chambers said that he was talking to a group of students in a college chapel. He said, we have to learn to make room for God, to give God a little elbow room. You know what I'm talking about. People get in your bubble and you don't like it and you say, I need some space. I need a little elbow room. I need a little social distancing. Some people wear a shirt these days that said, let's don't take social distancing away because I like it. But we need to make a little elbow room for God. Chambers said, we calculate and estimate and say that this will happen and that will happen. And we forget to make room for God as he chooses. He goes on to say, expect him to come, but do not expect him in any certain way. At any moment, he may break in. Always be in a state of expectancy and leave room for God to come as he likes. Life is always but predictable. Human nature is not fixed and settled. We live under hope. And that hope is rested in God, not the situation. Friends, sometimes it's hard because we want to do everything for ourselves. We say, well, there's no way that God can handle that. I need to handle it. But friends, God wants us to be people who rely on him in everything that we do. So God wants us to be a people who have problems for the right reasons. He wants us to be a people who remember he's in control and remember that we need to rely on him. But lastly today, I believe God wants us to be a people who risk caring for others. Who risk caring for others. And I would venture to say that this is one of the reasons that relationships is so essential to us at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. And why we believe that God has called us to build relationships with God as church in the world. Because we believe that God has called us to be risk takers when it comes to caring for other people. God wants us to be people who care. You see, after Galileo drove the accusers from the judgment seat, verse 17 tells us that they seized Sothians, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. Notice this, but Galileo paid no attention to any of that. That's what the ESV says. The King James Version tells us that Galileo cared none of these things. Some Bible scholars tell us that Galileo was known as a good and reasonable man. But the scripture here is clear. Galileo just didn't care. The NIV says that he showed no concern whatsoever that this man was being beat. Galileo didn't care about Sothenes being illegally beaten just outside the courtroom. Infinitely worse was that Galileo didn't seem to care that, about the truth that Paul was preaching in that day. Galileo just didn't care. But friends, God wants us to care. He wants you and me to care. And there's going to be risks that go along with caring. There's going to be risks with showing that we care for one another. Remember that Paul was in trouble again because he cared about the Lord and he cared about the people that were lost and were going to go to hell without an eternal relationship with Jesus. Paul was doing all that he could to follow the Lord and to spread the gospel amongst the towns. And amongst the areas that he, was, he had called him to. And friends, we must care as well. There is a cost to caring. You can get tired caring. You can get dirty caring. caring. You can get in trouble when you care. You can get your feelings hurt by caring. You can even get let down. But friends, nonetheless, God has called us to care. Mary Lewis was a small but significant example of caring for two friends at church. You see, these two guys named Paul and William decided that they really wanted to become godly men. They wanted to, to hold each other accountable. They wanted to become men who were accepted by God and, and, and were trusting in the Lord and, and being the type people that God wanted them to be. Paul decided that he wanted to break his bad habit of cussing. He had a bad habit of cussing. And so he wanted to break that. And so the two friends made an agreement. He decided that he was going to put five extra dollars in the offering plate for every time that he cussed throughout the week. So Sunday rolls around and he went and he told William that he had done that. And he said, I've, I'm acknowledging this. I'm letting you hold me accountable. And it's going to cost me $100 today for the $5 per time that I cussed this week. Paul must have been doing pretty well financially because 
that hundred dollars didn't stop him. It didn't help stop him from cussing. In fact, while he improved somewhat over the next couple of weeks, he really wasn't having the success that he wanted. So after the fourth week, William told Paul that he had decided that the deal needed to be changed a little bit. For the coming week, instead of Paul putting money in the offering plate for every time that he cussed, William said, I want to show you a thing called grace. And I want to put the money in the offering plate for every time you cuss. So William wrote a check to the church and he left the amount blank and he signed it and he gave it to Paul and he said, next Sunday, fill out this check and put it in the offering plate. You see, the next Sunday, Paul put the check in the, in the offering plate. The first week, it was $55. The second week, it was $20. The third week, they didn't have a check because Paul didn't have any words that he needed to say. And William went to him and he said, Paul, your sin costs, but God showed grace to you. And it was free. And he gave you that grace the same way that I've given you grace. Friends, today Jesus wants us to experience that grace. It doesn't cost us a thing. He sent his only son to die on the cross, to raise from the dead and ascend to the right hand of the Father so that one day upon death with the relationship with Jesus, me and you could spend eternity there. You see, it cost William to care and it's going to cost us too. But seeing the example in that story, it was worth it. It was worth it for William to just care a little bit and help his friend understand what grace looked like so that he could experience eternal grace from the Lord. So this morning in closing, what kind of people does God want us to be? What kind of person are you today? Are you a person who has problems for the right reason? Are you a person who remembers that God is in control? Are we people who rely on God's help? Are we people who risk caring for others? In just a few moments, the praise team is going to come back. And they're going to lead us in a new song. It may be that you've heard the song or you might have never heard it before. It's, It's really like last month it came out. And it's a song called Build Your Church. And This is the way the song begins. It says, On Christ alone, our chief cornerstone, no other foundation can we build upon, not philosophy nor the wisdom of man, all other ground is sinking sand. Upon this rock you build your church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. When we bind and loose, we proclaim your truth, and in Jesus' name we will not fail. He's building a church now. Friends, when we talk about the kind of people that God wants us to be, this is it. He wants us to be a people that he can build his church on. A solid rock, a foundation, not a sinking sand. Maybe you're here this morning and you would say that your life feels more like that shifting sand or that sinking sand. Maybe you've never experienced that grace that God grants us freely. All we have to do is admit that we need it. Admit that we're a sinner in need of salvation. Friends, this morning, if that's where you are, pray that you would come and cast your cares upon Jesus. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we thank you so much for today. And God, we thank you that we see an example from Paul of the kind of people that you want us to be, God. The kind of life that you want us to live, the kind of faith that you want us to have. And God, I pray that as Mount Pisgah Baptist Church, God, as we continue to strengthen relationships, God, we would be that firm foundation. God, we would be the people that you're building your church upon. That we would not have a life of shifting sand, God, but instead we would have a life that creates that firm foundation. Where we're trusting in you, God. Where we trust that you're in control where we understand when we have problems, it's because we're serving you, God. And Satan doesn't want that to happen. 
So he's going to throw every kink in the road that he can. God, we pray that we would be people who rely on you. God, we pray that at all cost, we would people who we would be people who care, who risk caring. God, for the lost, so that they would not die and go to hell, God, but instead they could have eternal life. Friends, maybe you're here today and you'd say you've never heard of that free grace. You've never experienced it. You've never trusted in Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you say, well, I've experienced that grace. But man, along the way, life just got tough. and I feel like I'm more living in that shifting sand. That I'm not allowing God to build his church on a solid foundation in my life. Friends, if either one of those is you, this altar will be open this morning. I'll be here if you need to talk. Friends, God's done some amazing things today. And I don't believe that he's done yet. And so, friend, if you need to do business with Jesus today, I pray that you would not walk out that back door the same way that you came in this morning. So as we've worshipped through song and we've worshipped through baptism and we've worshipped through scripture reading and through the reading of your word and the preaching of your word and through baby dedication, God, but I pray that we would continue to worship through song as we lift up the words to this song, God. You are our cornerstone. And all other ground is sinking, saying, God, upon you is where we have to put our trust and our faith and our hope. So friend, if you need to do business with Jesus today, I pray that you would do it before you walk out the back door. God, we thank you for allowing us to worship you today. We pray that the offerings that we brought to you today would be sweet and acceptable. Lord, change our hearts, change our lives, change our minds. Help us to become the people that you desire us to be. It's in your gracious and loving heavenly name we pray.